Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started here pretty quick. I, I, I think I've already been introduced, but uh, I'll kind of wait for the noise to settle down here. It's dark up here. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. <laughs> Well, it's great to be here in Seymour, Missouri, and it's great to be a part of this special event. I don't know where Dave and Connie are right now, but I want to thank them for putting this on. I see Connie over there, and I want to thank them for inviting me to be a part of it. Today, as I normally do, I'd like to talk about moving from production to profit in ranching. Uh, several years ago, I, I, I used to give a lot of talks in Canada. And when you go through uh, customs up there, where they all want to know what you're going through for, and uh, you know what your business is, and I said, "Well, I'm going to give a presentation. What are you going to talk about? Profitable ranching?" And she said, "Well, that's that's an oxymoron, isn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> Today's farmers and ranchers are more productive than ever before, but it's not showing up on our bottom line. I read recently within the last month that uh, through technology we have been able to increase, actually double our production in the last 60 years. Now that's pretty impressive. In 60 years we've doubled agricultural production. How many of you have doubled your profits in the last 60 years? I got somebody back there who thinks he has. I wonder, uh, is anybody here that knows how to turn on some lights? If I could get some of these lights on, I'd, I'd like to see some faces out there. Uh, can you find somebody wrong? Ask, ask Connie to find somebody. Anyway, I think if the truth be known, we're not as profitable today as they were our, our parents and or grandparents were 60 years ago. And probably because we've been focused on the wrong thing. If we focus on production, we can, we can increase that. We may need to be focusing on profit. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now before I go any farther, I probably need to tell you that unlike the other speakers you've heard here the last two days, I'm not qualified to be an expert in anything. However, I do tend to be very opinionated. I, I think Dave was alluding to that in his uh, introduction. I may not always be right, but I'm never in doubt. Now, whether you agree or disagree with me doesn't really matter to me. I, I assume that this is going to be a fairly easy audience for me to speak to. Most of you already agree with me, but I still hope to challenge you to put your periscope up periscope up and look outside the box you put yourself in. Because I don't care who you are, you put yourself in a box. My box is different than yours, your box is different than your neighbor's. But we all put ourselves in a box of some sort of paradigm. And I view the world around me by the box that I put myself in. If somebody doesn't come around and challenge me every now and then to look outside that box, we get trapped. And that's, that's all I'm going to try to do today is to challenge you to look outside the box you put yourself in. You know, I've already talked to some of you and they said, yeah, you know, we can't do that here because, you know, that's what I'm trying to challenge. You know, but whenever you think you can't do that here because, you're right. But your neighbor may be doing it. Hey, Dave Kreider. Dave. He, he escaped me again. I'd still like to have a few of those lights turn on back there if somebody could figure out how to do that. Oh, they're trying to figure it out? Okay. Our ranch is known as Pharaoh Cattle Company. It's located eight miles north of Cheyenne Wells, which is on the central high plains of eastern Colorado. Several of you today have asked me, what part of Colorado are you in? Well, that's the part of Colorado I'm in. Now, when you think of Colorado, that's not the part of Colorado most people think of. There are no mountains. In fact, we can't even see the mountains from there. There's no water and there's no trees. This is basically the High Plains Desert. 
Our normal annual precipitation in short grass country, our normal annual precipitation is around 12 inches per year. There, there comes some lots. I don't know if we can get one more or not. One more. Try one more. Anyway, we have a commercial cow herd as well as a registered cow herd. We sell around, our, our seed stock program consists of Angus primarily and Red Angus with some Herefords and some composites. We sell seven to 800 bulls every year. We have a bull sale every April and we have a bull sale every November. Uh, our November sale will actually be the first of November, which is just barely a week, just over a week away. I'm going to kind of set the stage here with, with some statements and questions. Agriculture that is not profitable and enjoyable will never be sustainable. Agriculture that's not profitable and enjoyable will never be sustainable. What do you think the average age of farmers and ranchers are, is today? 60, 65? 75. 75. Well, that's just in, just in Colorado, great. I'm going to say it's somewhere between 62 and 65. Does that sound like a healthy industry? No. I mean, there's a problem there, and we need to acknowledge that. When the average rancher or farmer is 65 years old, we've got a problem. Next year, he's going to be 66 years old. We just keep getting older. Why do you think the average rancher is 65 years old or farmer? Lynette. No youth coming back to the farmer ranch. I agree. Why don't? Why aren't they coming back? Because it's not profitable and enjoyable. It's not profitable and enjoyable. Exactly. In most cases, they they spent their entire life watching their parents work relentlessly, very hard, to break even. And often, mom and dad both have an off farm job. That doesn't look like something they want to come back to. So we need to acknowledge that. I want to introduce you to my neighbor Earl. Earl's sitting on the tractor there. Earl says, no, nah, I ain't thought much about retirement. I'm going to just keep working until I'm finished going broke. <laughs> Is that funny? <laughs> it's funny because there's a little bit of humor or uh, truth there. You know, we see ourselves there, we see our neighbors there. But it doesn't have to be that way. Does anybody here know what the future holds? Long term or short term? I believe that we're living in a time of more uncertainty than ever before in my lifetime. You know, I, I, anything could happen at any time and, and completely change what we've grown up used to. There are a few things that I think we, we can be fairly confident of, though. I'd like to share this fact with you. For the past 40 years, input costs have risen five times faster than cattle prices. For 40 years, input costs have risen five times faster than cattle prices. How many of you believe this trend will continue for the next five years? Is there anybody that doesn't believe this trend will continue? For the next five, ten, how about 40 years? I think it'll increase. You think it'll get worse? Yeah. Yeah. So what are we saying here? You know, I'm, I'm not trying to depress you, but I'm trying to awaken you to what's going on. You know, this is what's going on. We've increased production and yet our profits are going down. This is the reason. And we think it's going to stay this way or get worse. So we're going to have to do some things different or this business is in trouble. I believe the beef industry is at or very near a tipping point, a major tipping point. What's worked so well for the past 40 years will not work for the next 40 years. And that's uncomfortable for us. You know, I finally figured out what's going on, and now somebody's going to change things, change the game. Those who are the quickest to adapt and change will be in the driver's seat. Many of those people are here today. I mean, that, this is the type of people that I'm talking about. You've already adapted. You're in the process of changing. Uh, you will be, in, and you already are in the driver's seat. Those who are the slowest to adapt and change will get left behind or run over. For the most part, those people are not here. The fact that you're here today tells me of something about you. 
Uh, let's assume that some of these people are probably our neighbors, though. How about change? How many of you, oh, show of hand, how many of you really, really like change? Okay. I, I could have expected one up here. <laughs> Not very many of us like change. I, I get bored if everything's the same, but I, I hate major change. You know, for example, every time I give a presentation like this, I'm always standing on that side of the, of the screen. This is uncomfortable for me. Now, they were willing to move everything over there to keep me happy, and I said, no, I'm going to try to be flexible and do it. But I don't like change, even though I say I do. We're mostly, for the most part, we are creatures of habit. Once we get something figured out, we really don't want to change. It's uncomfortable. We have to rethink the things through. However, change is inevitable. It's going to happen, isn't it? So whether you like it or not, you need to learn how to accept it. In most industries, innovation is accepted and implemented in 17 to 24 months. For example, this is Gail up here, right? Let's say that Gail has an tire, automobile tire manufacturing company. Where do you live, Gail? In Emporia, Kansas. We're, ma we're making a, a, uh, automobile tires in Emporia, Kansas. Gail comes up with an innovative way to make a better tire for less money. He, he got, he's got a corner on the market. How long is it going to take his competition to catch on? Not very long. If they don't catch on, what's going to happen? He's going to put them out of business. However, in agriculture, it usually takes 17 to 24 years for innovation to be accepted and implemented. Is there anybody here that doesn't agree with that? I didn't see a hand up. What's wrong with us? Are we that slow? We're stupid. <laughs> we don't like changes. We don't like change. I don't think we're stupid, Greg. No. No. Right. Sometimes we act like it. Why does it take so long for somebody, to, when, when we know something's going to work, for example, management intensive grazing. Most of you are probably doing some rotational management intensive grazing, is that correct? How long have we known, and our neighbors known, that it makes money to do that? Longer than I've been doing it. 25 years. 10 years? 25 years. 25 years? 17 to 24 years. <laughs> I suspect it's been at least 20 years and for some people longer than that. What do you think, Jim Garrish? We started doing grazing schools in 1990. That was 20 years ago. There are some people in this room who were there 20 years ago still not have a uh, I thought you were going to say that they're still not doing anything. <laughs> she's going to talk about the neighbors today. That, that's a prime example of what we're talking about here. You know, we've known, and our neighbors really have known too, that management intensive grazing does work. And yet, they're not doing it. Why is that? What's the big hang, hang up here? 16-year-old farm. Paradigms. <laughs> a, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a, with Jim Garish up in Pocatello, Idaho, and it was it Mark Brackett? Is that this guy's name? I asked that, you know, are we that slow? What's the problem here? Why does it take so long for us to, to adapt and change? And Mark Brackett, and it was a fairly slowly, he said, we advance one funeral at a time. And that's a sad commentary, but I think it's true. The young buck that's out there doing all the work is living in his parents' or his grandparents' paradigm. Not by choice, but because he has to. And as soon as we can realize that, you know, that's the problem, we can, we can move ahead, and it's us old fellows that we've got to realize we're part of the problem. But I, I think that's more true than we want to admit. 
It doesn't have to be that way. I want to encourage